Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for October 25th, 2021. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the Trusted CI Framework, Overview and Recent Developments. Our presenter is Scott Russell. Scott is a Senior Policy Analyst at the Indiana University Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, CACR, and is a member of Trusted CI. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, and we will also take questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'll hand things over to Scott. Scott, four-time webinar champion, welcome. Thank you, Jeanette. All right, uh, I trust everyone can hear me as well. My mic is sometimes a little finicky. Yep, I can hear you. Perfect. All right, so uh, people who have been to my previous uh, talks might be a little disappointed that I'm not going to be talking about fancy legal stuff. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the other thing I spend most of my time on at a, at a, with Trusted CI, and that is the Trusted CI framework. So uh, as Jeanette said, my name is Scott Russell. I'm a senior policy analyst at CACR. I'm also the lead of the framework program for Trusted CI. I am here uh, wearing that second hat primarily. I'm going to be talking all things framework today. It's, it's going to be kind of a, a mixed bag. So uh, to start things off, I'm just going to give a quick intro to what is the Trusted CI framework, a little bit for uh, people who are unfamiliar. Uh, not going to go into exhaustive detail. There are, we have other talks where we do that. I'm also going to give some updates uh, on what's been happening with the Trusted CI framework lately, and a little bit of forecasting what's going to happen uh, starting next year. And then I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking through a, a quick uh, basic overview of how to get started using the Trusted CI framework. Because as you'll see in my goals for today, my number one goal is we want more framework adopters. I'll talk a little bit more about what this means, but uh, I'm not being coy with my goals with this talk. We created this framework. We think it's good. Now we want people to use it and, uh, or we want, want people to use it first and foremost. We'd also like to know about it because we like to hear that people are actually having successes. So uh, one of my other goals today is to give you some of the tools to start using the framework now, right? It's because of uh, some of the things about it, we think this is something you could pick up and start using right away. It doesn't require a whole lot of prep or anything like that. I want to make sure I answer any questions you might have, alleviate any concerns you might have. So um, I will take questions at the end. I will also probably pause throughout and uh, keep an eye on questions throughout. But if you have questions, feel free to throw them out there and uh, I'll be happy to try and answer them as quickly as I can. All right, so starting off, a quick overview of just what is the Trusted CI framework. Uh, kind of put simply, the Trusted CI framework is a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. So it's a, it's a guidance document we put out there that says, if you're trying to create a cybersecurity program, these are the 16 things you have to do. So we break it down into 16 musts. Those musts are clear and concise requirements. Uh, they're all imperatives. They tell you exactly what to do. It's based on best practices and evidence of what works. This is not, you know, a couple of people who think they're smart sat in a room and just came up with stuff kind of, you know, out of the blue. This is actually based on our experience uh, conducting assessments, engaging with the, you know, with the uh, NSF science community and uh, figuring out what actually works. Uh, finally, this is designed to be universal and timeless. So uh, although it was developed in an environment that is a little bit more science specific, the 16 must apply across the board. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the science specific work we've been doing as well. In addition to being uh, universal and that you know, applies to everyone is also timeless. We don't think any of these things are gonna change anytime soon. And when I talk a little bit more about what some of the musts are, I think that should be pretty clear to people who have not already experienced it. Uh, this is focused on cybersecurity programmatics, right? So uh, this is basically how you would manage cybersecurity. It doesn't go a whole lot in detail on the more technical side, which we, you know, which we think of as controls. So this is not going to say you have to have two-factor or you have to have a firewall that's configured X way. We don't go into that level. This is more about how about the programmatic side of it. So we have our four pillars of mission alignment, mission alignment. Sorry, I felt like I misspoke there. Uh, governance, resources, and controls. Um, if you're interested in just getting a very quick overview of what the 16 musts are, 
here they are. And just to give you a, a little bit of a flavor, I'll just call out a couple of them. I won't go through all of them in detail, um, but you'll see that like must seven under governance just says organizations must establish a lead role. So you, you need to have someone in charge of cybersecurity, right? That's sort of the level of um, specificity we're talking about here. These are not uh, pie in the sky, really difficult things to achieve. We think they are very doable. And uh, like another example, if you look down in resources at must 12, it just says you have to have a cybersecurity budget. This is not, again, this is not an onerous requirement, but it's something that's really, really important if you wanna manage cybersecurity effectively. Okay, so why should you adopt our framework, right? There's a lot of frameworks out there. A lot of people have framework fatigue. Uh, what's so special about this one? Why shouldn't I just, you know, kind of like put it in a bin like all the others? First and foremost, we just want to emphasize that this is doable. Uh, the Trusted Staff Framework is not a high bar. As we said, it's a minimum standard. And because of that, we think this is something that anyone who needs a cybersecurity program should be able to do and will benefit from. So first and foremost, this is doable. Uh, number two, it's designed to support your mission, right? This is not a uh, checkbox compliance exercise that uh, a lot of times frameworks kind of devolve into, or at least can feel like they devolve into, where someone has, you know, pre-selected a bunch of controls that may or not be that relevant to you. And the framework says, we'll do them all. We're not designed like that. This is completely different. You know, our first uh, pillar is mission alignment. And our first must is you have to align the cybersecurity program to your mission. So if you are not aligned to the mission, you are actually not doing the trusted CI framework correctly. So it's fundamentally supports the mission. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is built from uh, our on the ground experience and R&D. Um, and in particular, it point, it's, it's built off of things that we often see as common barriers to effective programs. So, you know, we engage with a whole lot of uh, uh, facilities and projects. And in doing that, we tend to see some of the common problem areas. And because of that, those have then fed into a lot of our recommendations. It was overseen uh, by stakeholders from across the community. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we have a framework advisory board, which uh, is built from uh, stakeholders all across the uh, research and science and uh, education sectors. Uh, and finally, this will enable, not finally, I'm sorry, second to finally, it will enable your, uh, the rest of your cybersecurity efforts. So there are a lot of frameworks out there that are more complicated, that are more onerous, and can be really daunting if you don't have even just the basic set of uh, cybersecurity fundamentals in place. This will put those fundamentals in place, which will then empower you to tackle things that might be a little bit more daunting. Like if you have to deal with controlled unclassified information, you know, CUI and NIST 800-171, uh, that's a set of controls. But if you don't have the programmatics in place to actually implement those controls, you might not even know where to start. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the things we do like to emphasize is that because this is focused on programmatics is not at the technical controls level, that this is uh, targeted at and understandable by organizational leadership in a way that a lot of cybersecurity uh, frameworks are not. Which means that you can actually bring this to your leadership and you, you can use it to build buy in. Alright, just very quickly, uh, a little uh, thing about the words we use, we use the words adopt and implement very intentionally and differently adopt does not mean that you are doing everything in the framework perfectly from, you know, from jump. Uh, that's not realistic. Adopt is a commitment to use the framework. This is saying a little bit more than it's just a resource that you've kind of like got in your file cabinet. This is a commitment that says we are actually going to base our program around this. All of the framework must become strategic priorities. But at the end of the day, adoption is a very easy bar, right? You're basically just making that commitment. And that's what we really want right now. We want people to adopt the framework. We recognize implementation is a little bit harder, right? Because you actually have to go out and do all the musts to a level that we think meets that minimum level of competence. The thing about implement is that I think for most organizations, you're probably already doing a decent number of the musts. Some organizations might be doing nearly all of them, uh, but there are probably gonna be some that require some work. And because of that, this is kind of a longer term goal. So implementing long term goal, a little bit harder. Our goal really is for people to adopt right now. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on why I have a new framework, because I feel like I already talked a bit about uh, why we think you should adopt. But uh, I think, in general, our sense was there was a, a gap in this area. And because there was a gap, well, there was a gap and we felt that this was a valuable addition. And those two things put together, uh, I think, are really what drove us towards building this new framework. 
So moving out of the basics of the framework, a little bit about recent events. So earlier this year, we published our first framework implementation guide uh, for research cyber infrastructure operators. And that sounds like a mouthful. I'll, I'll walk through all, what all of that means. Uh, framework implementation guide uh, is basically a audience specific deep dive into how to go about implementing all of the 16 musts. So as you'll hopefully remember, I said up top, all the, the, uh, the core framework with the 16 musts applies across the board. We think anyone who needs a cybersecurity program in the world should use the Trusted CI framework and they will see benefits. But if you are in a specific sector, exactly what each of the must means might differ. You know, if you're in science, it's gonna be different than you're in finance or something like that. And because of that, we created these audience specific deep dives that will give you a whole lot more uh, detail about how to actually go about implementing these things. So they include, you know, roadmaps. You know, what, what is the first thing I do? What's the second thing I do for this must? Uh, tailored advice about challenges. So again, because we have a lot of experience engaging with this community, uh, we've seen a lot of the common challenges and we have thoughts about how to overcome them and uh, pointers to resources. And in some cases, we'll make more uh, specific recommendations. So like for, for instance, must 15 says, you should adopt and use a baseline control set. Now, it doesn't actually say which baseline control set, it just says you should pick one and use it, right? It should be made by a third party. So you're not, you're not hand picking all your controls, but there's a bunch of them out there uh, you might pick one, you might pick the other, and there's good reasons for both. When we go into these audience specific deep dives, we'll say, you know what, we think for this community, you should really use, you know, in this case, the CIS controls. We think for a bunch of reasons, that's the best option. So you get stuff like that in uh, framework implementation guides, which we often call FIGs lovingly, you know, FI, you know, FIG. And it's, this one was targeted at research cyber infrastructure operators. I won't give you the full mouthful of what that definition means. It's in the, uh, the FIG document though. But basically it's kind of what the name implies. If you are operating research cyber infrastructure, you are probably a research cyber infrastructure operator. Um, real quick, we got a question here, Scott. Sure. Um, when considering what framework to adopt or implement, what if you have no choice but to be in compliance with other more complicated and daunting frameworks, for example, NIST 800-171, CMMC? Uh, do you re recommend still leveraging um, CI and direct support of these required ones? Yes. Okay. That's a very good question. Uh, I think one of the things I should emphasize, if I haven't already, the Trusted CI framework is not in any way exclusive as a framework. Um, it, is a, it is relatively light touch. It also coexists very well with all, with all, I think every other framework. I'm, I'm not aware of any frameworks that we do not coexist well with. So uh, the examples you gave like uh, NIST 800 I think is actually a perfect example of an area where the trusted CI framework would be overall a net benefit. Because like I mentioned, uh, 800 when you break it down is basically a control set, right? It's, it's built off out of FISMA. It's focused on confidentiality, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's just the controls. And if you don't have some of these other programmatic fundamentals in place, you might really struggle to actually go out and implement those controls to, in order to get you know, your contract or your grant, whatever is actually requiring 800-171 for you. Same with CMMC. Uh, CMMC has a little bit more on the programmatic side, but still is very controls focused. You know, with level, I mean, level three is basically 800-171. So these are all examples where we think having that programmatic uh, underpinning in play will really help you when you actually have to go out and get either the leadership support or the, the resources or the people to actually go and implement the controls that are being required. So uh, no conflict, we think this is a, that's a perfect example of where the Trust CI framework would be really helpful. Of course, even if you don't have any like compliance driver motivating you, we still think this is a good idea, right? Because cybersecurity is a good idea, right? That's at the core of it. And that's why we say the first must is uh, being tailored to the mission. So cybersecurity should never be bad for the mission because the first thing we say is you should make it good for the mission. Uh, all right, so uh, quickly just talking a little bit about a couple of other resources that are out there. So I mentioned the FIG, which is a very big document. Like it's an audience specific deep dive. It's not a document you would sit down and read cover to cover, probably. I mean, some people might. Most, for most people, it's more like, a, uh, like an encyclopedia. When you've got a question about a specific must, you turn to that page and you spend a little bit of time on just that one. 
Uh, a couple of other resources we've got available. Um, we recently updated our Master Information Security Policy and Procedures, or MISP, uh, template, which is uh, just very useful. We think it's one of, the, one of the few policies that basically every organization should have. Same with the uh, Incident Response Policy template. We recently updated that. That's another one we think everyone should have. We also recently added a new Cybersecurity Program Strategic Plan template. I'm going to end up talking about this more a little bit later, so I won't talk about it now. But uh, those new ones and all of our uh, pre-existing templates are all available at the Trust CI framework on the Trust CI website at the link available here. And uh, across the board, we're just always interested in feedback on, you know, what are you using? What are you having successes with? What, what challenges are you facing? Are there other resources or other templates that you think would be very helpful that we don't currently have? Really interested in all that kind of feedback. Okay, so a couple more uh, current events. So this past year, uh, Trusted CI has been engaging with Noir Lab, an NSF major facility, uh, focused on entirely on framework adoption and implementation. So Noir Lab came out uh, officially as uh, the first, well, sorry, I should rephrase that. Noir Lab is the first official framework adopter, right? They strategically uh, played that with us as such that then we immediately started an engagement that was focused on evaluating their uh, cybersecurity program posture and uh, reviewing their adoption implementation of the framework. So that was the first half of this year. Uh, we delivered an assessment report right at the midpoint of the year in July. And then the second half of the year, we've shifted the engagement to monthly workshops, which are designed to help Noir Lab take action on the highest priorities identified from that assessment report. And because all of this is based on the framework, all of these are, all of the actions we're helping them with are basically taking steps to uh, improve their implementation of one of the six, of some of the 16 musts. Um, this is just a generic, you know, tell us how you're doing with the framework. I already kind of talked about this. Uh, I think the important thing to understand about the Noir Lab engagement, though, is that starting in 2022, we are uh, piloting a new approach we're calling the framework cohort, which is built on the success of the Noir Lab engagement. So again, the Noir Lab engagement was our first engagement where we focused entirely on, on the framework. How are, how are they doing with the framework? And we think it's been hugely successful. Uh, anyone who attended the recent uh, NSF summit that we had uh, would heard you know, Chris Morrison, who is our primary contact there, uh, talk about the engagement and the uh, successes that they've been having you know, in their own words. So we wanna build on that success, but we also want to expand our ability to help people adopt and implement the framework because our traditional engagements are one-on-one, -on -one, you know, they take maybe six months or something like that, and that just doesn't scale very well. So our goal is to create a new approach uh, that instead of engaging one-on-one, -on -one, engages more one-on-five, one-on-six, one -on -six, something like that. But it's still, but it's building off of that same model of the Noir Lab engagement where we, uh, we focus on monthly workshops where uh, we have working sessions, we really work in depth on some musts and uh, then kind of like send them away with homework. And just because it helps us scale uh, much more effectively. Because as I mentioned up top, our number one goal across the board is we want more framework adopters and we want more framework implementers. Uh, a couple of the strengths about the cohort approach, uh, you get to learn from other uh, major facilities. So instead of a one-on-one -on -one engagement where you only kind of have your own solutions, you get to hear from peers about what are they doing, what successes are, what are they having, what challenges have they had to overcome, maybe you know pitfalls to avoid. Uh, you still get to benefit from the in-depth guidance of having uh, Trusted CI engaging with you directly. It's also a lower time commitment than a full assessment. So the pilot will start in 2022 uh, in January. It's a six month uh, period. We're targeting uh, four to six facilities uh, for this initial pilot. And it's the estimated time amount is roughly three to four hours for the actual workshops, and then maybe up to eight maximum as sort of like homework. Uh, a couple of outcomes you'll get if you engage in the framework cohort. Uh, number one, your, you know, your organization will have formally adopted the framework. Uh, number two, you will leave with a, uh, what we're, we're calling a validated assessment of your cybersecurity program, which just means that you will leave with a, essentially a scorecard that will tell you how are you doing on each of the 16 musts. And then finally, uh, you'll leave with a cybersecurity uh, program strategic plan. I mentioned, I talked about this before, that 
directly connects cybersecurity to your organization's missions, your mission, mission or missions, I should say. It defines a cybersecurity strategy, and then it sets out a timeline of milestones where you'll actually lay out how you uh, will implement uh, the remaining must to get you to be fully implementing across the board. So anyone interested in the framework cohort, you can apply at trustedci.org. Or if you have any more questions, you can feel free to reach out to uh, our, the email address listed here or to mine, if, which I believe is at the end of the slide deck. All right, how am I doing on time? Oh yeah, I'm doing fine. Okay, so I'll pause very briefly if anyone has any questions about anything I've covered thus far. And if those, those of you who are watching, uh, I posted those links in the chat. Um, so if you wanna grab those to follow up on later, you're welcome to do that. Great, thanks, Jeanette. All right, uh, well, if there are any questions, then uh, wait, now I see one just popped in. Yep, uh, what if the organization is a regional environment with multiple institutions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, this is uh, one of the more common uh, cases that we've seen in like the science and uh, research world are these sort of collaborative, multi-site, basically complex organizational structure organizations. And um, well, one, we think the sort of like the easy answer, which may or may not be helpful to you, is if you need a cybersecurity program, then we think you should use the trusted CI framework. Now, technically not everyone needs one. There are some uh, you know, smaller projects that are embedded within larger organizations. If your larger parent organization has a cybersecurity program of its own, you might be so fully protected by that that you don't need to do anything special. Like you don't actually need the, uh, you don't need the formalization of your own program because mostly kind of the parent organization is taking care of it. Now, if that's not the case, uh, and you are instead uh, just a multi-institution collaboration, but no overarching parent, you probably still need a cybersecurity program. It'll just be a little bit more complicated because you have to grapple with the various, you know, you have multiple institutions. And so all of them kind of need to come together and agree on, you know, who is going to be the cybersecurity lead for this collaboration. And uh, there are a couple of other uh, sort of edge cases like that, where some must will be just a little bit more complex because of the complex organizational structure you're dealing with. But at the end of the day, the, the must still stand, like the reason for having them is still very important. So I would say uh, definitely still um, an appropriate use case for the trusted CI framework. Uh, this is an area that we recognize though is a little bit more complicated. It's um, I would say all kind of on the short list for when we create um, another in, you know, so we mentioned we have these audience specific deep dives, which is the framework implementation guide or the FIG. The first one was for research cyber infrastructure operators. If we make a second one, it's I would not be at all surprised if it is focused on multi-institution collaborations because there's just a lot of uh, unique details there. Oh yeah, great question on, uh, on the cohort. I'll back up to this. I believe um, and uh, one of the other trusted CI people in the chat can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, that the deadline for applications is November 12th. That's, yeah, that's what the website's saying, yep. Okay, perfect. So um, please get your applications in as soon as possible, right? We already have a couple of, uh, of good ones in, so act fast because again, we're, look, we're targeting a relatively small number of institutions for the first pilot. All right, and with that, I will, uh, I'll move on. So the final section I'm gonna try and talk about today is basically steps for getting started. So I said the framework's great. We all think you should use it. You might be thinking, okay, but what do I do first, right? You know, help, help, you out, help me out a little bit. So that's my goal for the next uh, 30 or so minutes is to just walk through what we think like the first three steps are for basically any organization that wants to get started using the framework. Uh, I, I apologize a little bit in that I am compressing what was a much longer and more fleshed out training uh, from a couple of weeks ago into basically a half hour time slot. So I might be rushing a little bit and I'm, I'm going to be skimming over some details, but this is something that uh, if you're interested, feel free to reach out and we can obviously 
uh, talk more about it. All right, so getting started, a little bit of context. The big point here is you're not just going to implement all 16 musts in one day, and you almost definitely are not going to make progress on them all simultaneously, right? You're basically going to have to pick and choose a couple to make progress on and then pick a couple that you're going to do later. And uh, because of this, well, I mean, and the second key point is that the specific musts you pick are not going to be the same across the board. Organizations vary. There's no correct order to doing all 16 musts because of a bunch of different factors that may affect your organization. And we'll talk about some of these, but you know, where are you in your life cycle? Are you operational or are you in the construction phase? You know, what's your mission? What are your current levels of cyber capability? Have you had any incidents recently? Are you facing like particularly uh, acute threats? There's a bunch of factors that will impact which musts you choose to prioritize, but the very first steps are largely the same regardless. So our goal is basically here to set you up so that you will then know how you should tackle the rest of the 16 musts. And of course, I say there's three steps, but there's technically a step zero, which is just, do I even need a cybersecurity program at all? I kind of touched on this already, but there are some uh, facilities or organizations that are embedded within a parent such that all of their cybersecurity needs are, needs are kind of covered. They don't have any uh, specific use cases that fall outside of that parent organization. And in those cases, they might not need a cybersecurity program, in which case uh, you should always ask the question up front, like, do I need this? Now, we think for most of the audience that we're talking to, uh, this is going to be this is going to be mostly a no brainer, right? If you are like an NSF major facility, it's a no brainer. You need a cybersecurity program. If you are a large organization of any kind, if you have any kind of unique mission, these are all uh, scenarios where you're going to want to have your own program because you want cybersecurity to be aligned to that mission. And if your parent does not share your mission, then their cybersecurity is not going to be aligned to it. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here. But if you go to Appendix A of the FIG that we've been talking about, uh, we talk about a bunch of factors that'll, imp that'll impact whether or not you need a cybersecurity program. Moving forward, I'm going to assume everyone here needs one, which is probably true. Okay, so a quick overview of just what the general approach looks like. Step one, you just got to assess where your program is. Uh, this is. The goal here is to do a very quick assessment. This is not exhaustive. This is not going to be at the same level of detail that like when if trusted CI were to come and engage you, we would spend a whole lot more time trying to dig into the facts and find out really what's going on on the ground. That's not what we're going for here. We're just trying to get a basic sense of just some level of ground truth, right? Uh, because you want to understand where you are before you choose your priorities. Uh, second step is then to determine your priorities. Uh, in this case, you're going to be weighing a couple of different factors we're going to talk about. But the ultimate goal is to figure out just what matters the most to you right now, because there are some musts that are going to probably be more important to you than other musts, and implementing those should, will be your priority. And then the third step is to formalize your strategy. Uh, now, you might be thinking, but the previous step was determining my priorities. Once I have my priorities, isn't my strategy just to follow those priorities? This is a little bit more nuanced than that. The keyword here is probably actually formalize because the, what you're trying to do is document your strategy and get leadership buy-in. Uh, because that's one of the best ways to actually make sure that stuff happens is to you know, put it in front of leadership, get their support, and uh, then you can actually make it, make it happen. This also helps establish a timeline for implementation. So rather than just saying, oh, I've got my priorities, I'll just start with the first one. This says, okay, how long do I think it's gonna take me to do all of them? And then am I okay with that? Do we need to actually maybe put more resources in up front just to try and get this stuff done in a reasonable amount of time. So I'm gonna walk through each of these steps relatively quickly. Um, and as I mentioned before, feel free to uh, reach out with questions. Because there's three steps, I might stop after each step just to see if we have any questions uh, around that point. Okay, so step one is assess, right? Just figure out where you are. Uh, the point here is just you got to know where you are before you help before you start doing any prioritization. You're not going to prioritize something that you are already doing really well, and you don't want to. You, there are some, some there might be some musts that you are completely missing, and you want to know that like oh I'm just not doing must six or something like that because those are probably going to be ones that you're going to prioritize. 
Uh, and a, a point we put down here at the bottom is that the point of any cybersecurity assessment should be to inform decision making. And so that's what this assessment is doing, right? You're about to make a decision on which must am I going to prioritize. This assessment is designed to help determine what you're going to prioritize. Okay, so what we're talking about here is a very lightweight self-assessment. Again, this is not what Trusted CI would do if we were coming in and trying to get all the facts and give you a really robust score. This is a, this should be quick. It should be a little bit, uh, a little bit loosey goosey, but it'll help give you that, uh, that just base level of facts on the ground. So the first thing we think you should do is just look at the language of uh, each must and then look at the, uh, there's base, if you uh, look in the FIG or in the uh, framework core website, there is what we call in the box text, which is just a, a short paragraph explaining what the language in the must means. So we think just go look at each of language of each of the must statements and uh, look at that, uh, that framework core text and ask yourself the very basic question, are we doing this, right? This is not gonna be, uh, we're not trying to be like super lawyerly about it. We're not going to be picking, you know, putting too much emphasis on the words. We're just trying to get a basic sense of, you know, are we doing this? And the kind of answers that we're proposing to use are not the most robust, right? They're, they're these kind of loose categories of, well, there's no, I'm just not doing it. And then you want to ask, well, why not? There's sort of where you're basically saying I'm doing it in a partial way. You know, maybe I'm doing like there's a couple of keywords in there, and I, I'm doing some of them, but not the others. And as you can see, you can ask yourself some questions about like, well, why or am I only doing some of it? Are there barriers? Also, you might say yes, I actually am doing this. So no, sort of yes, pretty self-explanatory. And um, some of the things we're noting here is. Your lightweight assessment is probably going to be uh, pretty easy if you are very young or very disorient or very disorganized, uh, because uh, the chances are it's just going to be it might just be not that great across the board. Um, but yeah, like I mean, the point here is that there are some some organizations are going to be mostly immature, some organizations are going to be mostly mature. We think most are going to be somewhere in the middle, though where you really, uh, you just need to go through it with a little bit more detail. Okay, so a couple of just, um, you know, tips for when you're actually conducting this lightweight assessment. Uh, step number one, just write, write it down, right? Actually write down what you're talking about. Don't just do it in your head. As you're gathering facts, write down those facts. You should write down, you know, who said it? What did they say? Again, you should focus on the facts. You wanna be honest about what the facts are, right? No one, no one, this is not in like an external audit where you're trying to get approval to do something you want to do. This is an internal evaluation. So there's no value in lying to yourself. And one of the things we often find uh, from our engagees is that they will always tell future people, future engagees, uh, just be honest, right? This is, you know, there's no value in having like ego about what your score is going to be. You just want to get as honest the facts on the ground because that'll help you prioritize what actions to take. Um, you should definitely discuss, like you should probably have multiple inputs. Don't have just one person do it all. Uh, talk it out with other people. Definitely use the uh, framework implementation guide as a reference tool. Uh, even if you are not technically a research cyber infrastructure operator, there's still going to be a lot of good uh, context and uh, likely a lot of good advice in those documents, even if it is not specifically targeted at your uh, community or sector. And then finally, use whatever outputs you get to help drive decision making. And then, of course, don't, as I mentioned before, think of this as an audit or a score or anything like that, right? This is an internal evaluation just to help you make decisions about priorities. Um, also, if you are reading the FIG, we think there's a lot of great advice in the FIG. You don't have to treat it all as mandatory. Like, technically, the only things that we think are mandatory if you're doing the framework is the language of the must, right? It says you need to have a budget. It doesn't mean that that budget has to, you know, be itemized to the nth degree and have tons of detail and it has to be a certain amount. No, it just says you need to have a budget. And finally, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is just always good advice. Um, that even if things are just, even if your score is just okay, say, okay, I got a pretty good amount of information. I'm going to say we got a sort of, you know, I'm not going to round myself up. I'm going to be honest with where I think my grade is. 
Now, if you want to get fancy, and we don't necessarily recommend that you do, but if you want to know kind of how Trusted CI has, has done these, or at least how we did it with the Nora Lab engagement, uh, we have these things called must implementation ratings, where we will, we will look at an engagee and we'll give them a score uh, from the range of not implementing to developing to implementing to optimizing. These are mostly self-explanatory, but not implementing means you're just not doing the must. You know, we found little or no evidence that uh, there's any s systematic progress towards that must. Developing is kind of like that sort of where we're saying, look, there is some progress, but it is definitely not complete yet. And uh, so there's work that still needs to be done here. Implementing means you have met that uh, base level of competency. Doesn't mean that you're like a master or anything, but it means you've met the minimum standard that we've laid out. Optimizing means you're going above and beyond the minimum standard. So, and then you can see over here, we've got a completely, you know, arbitrary set of scores we made up for a sample organization. These are not in any way reflective of reality, but it gives you this scorecard that helps you get a better sense of just where is my organization? Uh, am I mostly in the green? Am I mostly in the red? Is it kind of a mixed bag? Because we, th uh, we found a lot of times having that visual reference can be very helpful, whereas just kind of reading facts can be a little numbing. You don't, it, this is a good way of quickly communicating a lot of information. All right, so I'll, I'll pause really briefly there if there are any questions about the assess step. I realize I'm going kind of fast and I apologize. <laughs> I think we're okay. Okay. I was also giving myself an excuse to drink some water. Yeah, that's, please do. Okay, so moving on to the second step then, prioritize. The second step is determine your priorities, right? And we talked about this before, but you don't wanna push all, you don't wanna try to push all 16 stones up the hill at once, right? It's probably not gonna work. And also not every must is gonna be equally important to you right now. Uh, depending on a bunch of factors uh, that are about your organization, some musts are going to be more important than others, and you should focus on those musts. So the goal of the prioritize step is let's pick the musts that are most important for us to prioritize in the short term and uh, focus on them, right? We're going to ask ourselves, what is most important for our mission? Uh, what do we really need to start first? Uh, what are some things we need to finish first? And uh, what are the factors that should play into this decision? Um, and just a little bit more on the what to start first and what to finish first. There are some things, we make this distinction because in some cases, uh, we think it's important to start something early, most of the time e because it'll have like a actual long implementation time. So the example we always use is, let's say you say you're deciding we need to hire a CISO or you know a cybersecurity lead, whatever your role you actually end up calling them. Hiring time for uh, CISOs can be pretty lengthy, right? It's difficult to find good candidates. You might, you might have an organization where it just takes a long time to hire people anyways. So it's really important that you start the hiring process soon, even if you don't need to have that CISO for a year, because it might take you a year just to go through the hiring process. So if you wait a year before you even start, then it takes you two years. I distinguish that from like, what do you need to finish first? Because there are some things where it's just the outcome of being done. You know, you know, having like half of an incident response policy is not that useful. You want to have the whole policy. So we don't focus as much on starting there. We focus on finishing. But most of what we're going to be talking about here are those factors. So, you know, step 2.1, uh, the first thing you're going to focus on is what are the major gaps in your cybersecurity program? So you did your self-assessment. You have maybe like a rudimentary scorecard where you answered no sort of yes across the board. Um, did you answer any no's? Because you know, because these are examples of areas where you're basically doing nothing on a must. If you did, those are almost always going to be a priority. In a lot of cases, just getting to that sort of rating, right, or like developing in the more fancy ratings, can be a significant pr improvement because you're going from nothing to something, right? You're you're not 100% of the way there, but just getting a little bit better actually can uh, can be a, a world of an improvement. Uh, that being said, if you are an organization that is looking at a whole lot of no's, uh, don't panic. It's totally fine. Uh, this is probably a more common scenario than anyone would like to admit. But you will get there. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't actually matter if you are doing terribly on all the musts or you're doing great on all the musts. 
or great on most of the must at least, when you're prioritizing, you still need to be strategic in what you're going to work on first. And uh, in the case where you have a lot of gaps, it might not be, it's just not helpful to say, oh, I'm just going to focus on the gaps because there are too many gaps for you to focus on. So you need to identify some other factors that then might make some must more important than others in the short term. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, basically, this boils down to that, although every organization is unique, as we said up top, and that everyone's going to kind of pick their own path, you're not that unique. And that we actually think that there are some common factors that are going to be underlying a lot of organizations. And those factors will be one of, if not the driving force behind a lot of your choices. So this is just a very quick overview. I'm going to go through all these in more detail. But as I mentioned, uh, where are you in your life cycle? What is your organizational structure? Uh, what sorts of resources, resource constraints are you facing? Have you had an incident? Uh, are you facing compliance? Stuff like that. So I'm going to talk about each of these factors in a little bit more detail. Um, and then also talk about what must you are likely going to want to prioritize if you fit into that category. So first big factor is life cycle, right? Where are you in your organizational life cycle? Are you operational, right? Are you just carrying out your mission on a day-to-day -day basis? In that case, you're probably going to want to focus first on putting out fires and being prepared for incidents, right? This is, you're out there in the world, you're facing live threats, you got to kind of put up a basic level of defense. So we think in that case, you should, in that case, you should focus on getting a must 15, good. This is establishing a baseline control set. Uh, must nine, in particular, your incident response policy, uh, because incident response is one of those things where you definitely want to be prepared beforehand. Uh, incidents can be uh, very messy scenarios, and if you have not practiced and you are not prepared, uh, you know it's very easy to kind of run around with your hair on fire and not get a whole lot done, and that can make incidents a lot worse. And uh, must thirteen personnel, uh, you might just need more people to actually uh, be prepared uh, for implementing all the stuff you need to implement uh, because you're live and operational. Whereas if you're in construction, you actually have just more time. And because you have more time, you can focus on some of the things that uh, tend to be hard when you're operational, but are much more effective if you get at them early. So one of the ones we like to emphasize is uh, must one, mission focus. It's a really complicated must, right? It says you should align cybersecurity to the mission that sounds good, but when you actually think about, you know, how do I do that? It's challenging, right? It's it's a constant struggle to uh, to get that just right. But if you are in construction, you've got time to start early. You can actually put mission fo you can put that mission focus into all of your decision making, so you don't have to go back and try and change things later. Uh, similarly, uh, must three information assets. Uh, this is about documenting your information assets. You might think of it as like one of the basics is having an asset inventory. Asset inventories are notoriously difficult. For any live organization who has had to deal with this knows it's a little bit of a mess. There's no tool that just automates it as well as we would like. There's always going to be a lot of manual work, you know, putting stuff in spreadsheets. And it would be much easier, everyone agrees on this, if you started early and you had an inventory process that just caught everything from the beginning rather than waiting until everything is out there in the world and then trying to chase it all down. So if you're in construction, great time to focus on must three. All right, another big factor, this actually goes back to one of the questions we had earlier about uh, sort of like multi-institutional organizations. Uh, but what is your organizational structure? Uh, are you embedded within a parent organization? In that case, you probably have resources you can take advantage of, right? This is a case where you are embedded within a parent organization, but you still need your own cybersecurity program. In these cases, though, you still want to make sure you're maximizing the value you're getting from that parent organization. So we recommend focusing on the must that are focused on those types of things. So must two is stakeholders and obligations. It's making sure that you have that relationship with the parent organization really solid. And must 14, which is about taking advantage of external resources, because you don't have to do everything internally in your cybersecurity program. You can have third parties help with that, or in this case, parent organizations. Um, that's if you're embedded within a parent organization. If you are a standalone facility, uh, you're probably on, on the hook for just about everything. And because of that, you might be focused much more on your controls uh, because you don't have any uh, inherited controls from your parent organization that maybe flow down that like passively protect you. You're actually on the hook for everything. So you better make sure your controls are pretty good. 
And then finally, if you're a multi-institutional or collaborative entity, as we were talking about earlier, a lot of the musts you're going to want to focus on are probably going to be uh, coordination focused. So again, uh, must two stakeholders and obligations, making sure you have all of the different uh, institutions uh, accounted for. Information assets are going to be much more challenging because you have to figure out who owns what and what policies apply to what assets. With multi-institutional uh, organizations, that's just a much more complicated endeavor. Uh, risk acceptance will be more challenging because there's multiple institutions and each institution probably has its own risk acceptance policy. So you got to figure out how those kind of coalesce for the collaboration. And uh, similar with policy, if every uh, of the uh, member institutions has their own policies, but then there's also policies that apply to the collaboration, you need to figure out the overlap, which policies apply when, where are there potential gaps that need to be covered. Those are all things that are going to be much more challenging if you're in a multi-institutional uh, situation. Uh, all right, another factor that's going to be pretty common is if you don't have uh, any resources, right? This is a, another pretty common problem I think a lot of people have. If you're facing resource constraints, your focus is then going to be on trying to get more resources. So uh, we mentioned making as much of use as you can of external resources, particularly free ones. Uh, there's, there's a surprising amount that's free out there. And uh, you want to take advantage of that, including a lot of offerings that Trusted CI offers. Uh, you want to build leadership buy-in and involvement. This is going to be through must five and must six, uh, because if leadership is involved, leadership typically controls the purse strings. That way, you'll actually be able to maybe get some more resources to then carry out the rest of the must you need to. And then you want to focus on increasing and formalizing resources. So must eleven is about uh, dedicating adequate resources to the cybersecurity program. And must 13 is about having personnel resources because you need people to do the stuff and you need to have the actual money to go out and do it. And then I kind of jokingly say, if you have too many resources, then you have nothing to complain about. Your life must be nice. Okay, last two uh, factors really quickly. I realize I'm running short on time here. Uh, the first one is if you've recently experienced an incident, uh, you want to focus on, you know, one, any lessons learned from that instance, that'd be must 10 evaluation or refinement, because uh, you want to take action to basically remediate whatever problems you found from that previous incident. Uh, must nine, you want to make sure your IR policy is up to snuff. If you didn't have one, this is a great time to get one. If you did have one, this is a great time to revise it based on any problems you may have found. Now, it could be your IR policy just was amazing, in which case, great job, focus on some other stuff. Final one will be information assets. I think uh, anyone who's had to deal with an incident knows uh, it's really hard to know if you've like in the case of an incident, the first thing you want to know is, well, what stuff do I have and what is its status? You know, how far does the incident spread? And if you don't even have that basic uh, understanding of your information assets, it's going to be really difficult to uh, do that base triage. And then finally, the last uh, factor I'll talk about here is compliance. So if you recently or anticipate having uh, compliance, for example, uh, controlled and classified information, uh, the cybersecurity maturity model certification with the Department of Defense, export control, uh, GDPR, which is a European privacy law. All of these are basically just compliance regimes that maybe or do affect you. Uh, well, the first thing you want to focus on is must two, which is about setting up your uh, obligations. Compliance would be an obligation, making sure you get those in order. And then probably you want to focus on must 15, your baseline control set, because most compliance regimes, when you boil them down, they're going to be very focused on certain controls. Like CUI has 800-171, which is a control set. CMMC also uses 800-171 with a couple of uh, tweaks. Export control has its own controls as well. GPR is kind of a separate beast. But controls are going to be very important in any compliance, uh, in any organization that is facing compliance. OK, so I'll pause again. I just finished step two, which is about figuring out your priorities and the factors. Are there any questions on that? No questions yet, but um, those of you who are watching, um, one of the attendees posted an IT asset manager um, that they use and recommend. So if you're if you're in need of an IT asset manager, uh, go ahead and click on this link uh, that I that was posted in the chat. I think you can continue. Thank you. All right, great, thanks. All right, only nine minutes left, so I'll, I'll rush a little bit. Last step, step three, is strategize. Or as I said before, formalize your strategy. 
the context here is that having a strategy is good. Having a strategy that has um, that is formalized and has organizational buy-in is significantly better. So the goal here is not just to have a strategy, but it's to make it nice and formal and to build that leadership buy-in to help you actually achieve the strategy. Uh, so a couple of things that this uh, step is going to focus on is you want to very clearly draw the connection between cybersecurity and the mission. This is something we talk about a whole lot, but in practice is sometimes a little bit more difficult. And so we want to give you a tool that will be, uh, we think, very helpful in communicating that connection between cybersecurity and the mission. You want to articulate your strategy for actually implementing the 16 musts or any, and other, any, any, excuse me, and any other cybersecurity goals you might have. And finally, to lay out a timeline for actually implementing all of the things you want to get done, because having that timeline will then help you realize, is it feasible? Is this going to be way too long before we're, we've reached that minimum level of competency? OK, so what I'm basically going to be talking about here is a very quick walkthrough of the document I mentioned earlier, the Cybersecurity Program Strategic Plan Template. This is available at trustedci.org. It is a model for your program uh, your cybersecurity program strategic plan. One of the things, or well, a couple of things I'll talk, I'll say about this upfront. This is designed to be simple and easy to use. Uh, anyone who has uh, traveled down the rabbit hole of strategic planning, you know, in quotes, this is a very big, uh, it's a huge field. There's just a ton of stuff out there to read. Uh, it can be confusing, a little bit overwhelming. And we wanted to make something that would be valuable to uh, the community but we didn't want to overwhelm them with a whole lot of uh, structure and formality, particularly when we didn't have a whole lot of experience with that model. So we literally adopted what is known as the simple model of strategic planning. And then we just uh, framed it to fit within uh, the cybersecurity program model. And also I should say that this is a customizable document. This applies to all of our templates. This is designed to give you a starting point uh, when you're drafting a strategic plan, but you are under no obligation to rigidly adhere to all of the sections. Uh, I will, however, talk about what I think are the most important elements. There's basically four that I think should go into any strategic plan. So a little bit about strategic planning basics. Uh, what should your strategic plan do? Uh, this is a, a commercial that we love internally on my team. Uh, I apologize if you don't get the reference. I don't have the time to show you the commercial. Uh, all right, so what should a strategic plan do? We think there's basically four key steps. Step number one, you should state your organization's mission. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but this is not just restating your mission statement, right? The sort of air qu in quotes mission statement. Um, for a bunch of reasons, uh, those tend to not be as helpful as what we're looking for here. We want to be a little bit more direct, a little bit more meaty when we talk about the mission. Uh, and then step two, you want to state how the cybersecurity program supports the organization's mission. So you're basically, I sometimes will call this the cybersecurity, the cybersecurity program's mission. Uh, but then you start using mission a little bit too much, it might get confusing. So you just think, how does the cybersecurity program support the mission? Step three is to describe your cybersecurity strategy. And then step four is to establish a timeline of strategic outcomes and milestones. Those are the four things that we think should go in any strategic plan about your cybersecurity program. So just very briefly walking through each of those uh, four steps. The first step is to state your organization's mission. And the goal here is to very succinctly state the high level goals and priorities of your organization. As I mentioned before, this is probably not going to be the more fluffy mission statement. Because mission statements can serve a lot of purposes, which are not always about communicating uh, internally what is the mission. They can be externally facing kind of like marketing tools. and. Uh, I've, we've read a lot of mission statements uh, when researching mission and just found that they tend to not be as helpful. The goal here is to identify what does your organization actually do and what does your organization actually care about? Uh, because this is going to be a big driver in what your mission actually is. And another tool that we, I mean, another uh, concept that we think is helpful here is the concept of mission decomposition which just means that mission is complex, right? If you are a university, all right, your, your highest level mission might be a couple of things, right? It's you want to, uh, you're, you're teaching students, you're engaging in research, and maybe a third thing, right? And you might say, those are my three strategic missions at the highest level. But the university does a lot of things. And if you go down from that strategic, that kind of top level to a more operational, you might have like research centers within 
the uh, university, those research centers have their own missions. And those kind of need to be taken into account when looking at the university's full mission. So we think it's helpful to consider the kind of the full mission stack. Uh, and so over here on the side is just a, a very basic Google graphic I put together, which says you should look up to. So you might say like, all right, so we are embedded within a parent organization. That parent organization's mission probably has some impact on our mission, so we should take it into account. But also we might have, uh, you know, subunits beneath us that also have their unique missions. Those need to be taken into account too. And then you kind of want to compile all, those, all these together to create just a very basic understanding of what is the mission, what is the stuff we care about the most. Once you've got that kind of uh, a little bit messy discussion out of the way, uh, the next step is much simpler, which is how does the cybersecurity program actually support that mission? And I just gave a couple of basic examples here. It could the cybersecurity program might be focused on protecting the integrity of scientific data and data flows, right? Making sure that the uh, the data that we collect is accurate, not being uh, maliciously or unintentionally altered. It could also be about ensuring uh, the availability of high uptime high uptime scientific equipment, um, or it could be about you know providing security as a service to a bunch of smaller projects that uh, are beneath you. So I think most people probably here, if you are a cybersecurity person, you will understand how your cybersecurity program supports the mission. The goal here is then to draw the connection between what the cybersecurity program does with that mission. So you state the mission and then you say, and here's how the cybersecurity program enables that mission. Uh, the third step is about stating a strategy. So we know what the organization's mission is. We know how the cybersecurity program supports the mission. What is our strategy to actually achieve that? So this should be directly tied to the previous step. Uh, this should also be temporally limited, right? It's a strategy. It's not going to last in perpetuity. Uh, the whole strategic plan will have like a timeline of like maybe three to five years. Uh, but the goal is, you know, what is our focus? What is our strategy right now? Uh, a very common strategy for a lot of organizations might be, we just want to get to a basic level of competency on a couple of fundamentals. So you're looking at your, your, at your cybersecurity program and saying, oh, this has a lot of gaps in it. Your strategy might be, we're going to push all of our effort into closing all those gaps. Or you might be looking at a baseline control set that you need to implement, seeing a lot of gaps there and saying, all right, our cybersecurity strategy right now is to push on the most important controls first and get as many of those done as we can. Uh, that would be like a uh, uh, get the basics done first strategy. There might also be like a triage focus, which is we got to focus on putting out existing fires first, right? If you're in an organization that already has maybe a lot of compromises or breaches. Uh, you can also imagine a strategy that says, look, I want to keep security's job as simple as possible. So our strategy is going to be eliminating as much complexity as possible. You know, everyone's using the same operating system. We're all on the same devices. No one's doing, you know, using unique software. It's make it as simple as possible because then security's job will be easier. And then the final step, I realize I'm almost out of time here, is uh, to set up a timeline. So this is just the timeline of strategic outcomes and milestones. Uh, you want to make things concrete and time limited. As I mentioned, this document will have a, a deadline, you know, three years, five years, something like that. These are not abstract goals. They should all be clear outcomes that you will be able to like kind of check off when you've achieved them. If it's hire a CISO, you should be like, we hired them. Uh, if it's uh, adopt a baseline control set, you have adopted it. If it's implement all 16 of the uh, trusted CI frameworks must, you can say we have implemented them all. And as I mentioned before, there's going to be that distinction between what do I need to start soon and what do I need to finish soon? I'm not going to rehash that. And then just a very basic idea. This does not have to be broken down by months. We did it here in half years. You could do it in whole years. You could do it in quarters, kind of whatever works best for your organization. And there's also an example, I believe, in the uh, template. All right, and then just to very quickly recap, final. this is like my final slide, I think. Sorry, I might be running just like one minute over. Uh, what should you do next? Uh, download the resources we've got. You'll do a self-assessment against the framework must. Again, very simple self-assessment. Download the strategic plan. And uh, when in doubt, reach out to Trusted CI for help. And with that, I will say thank you. I apologize, I went a little bit over. I'm happy to take any questions if people are willing to stick around. Uh, otherwise, I will pass it back to Jeanette. Thank you. Um, while people are typing, and I, I'll be here too, so if, if anyone wants to hang around to ask a question, you can stick around and, and do that. Um, so if you go hit hit the next slide, please. Uh, 
I just have a couple of brief community updates to give people time to type. Um, first is the next Trusted CI webinar is Monday, December 6th at 11. Um, our topic, I, I'm very excited about this topic. It's uh, Michigan State's uh, ransomware attack. Um, our presenters are members of Trusted CI and, um, and MSU. We've got Andrew, Vaughn, and Julie uh, joining Thomas Sue of MSU. Um, they will be going into a recent ransomware attack at MSU and uh, the steps that they took to mitigate it. Um, and this is all in the form of a report that Trusted CI published uh, earlier this year. Also, uh, thank you for joining us at the 2021 NSF Cybersecurity Summit. Stay tuned for updates um, to the webpage for archived slides, videos. Uh, any announcements will probably be communicated and linked there. And um, for those of you who are attending, we'll see you at, at SC 2021. So that's, um, I think, I believe it's a hybrid event this year. It's down in St. Louis. Um, and uh, we've got a few trusted CI people uh, presenting there. I've got some information about it on our home uh, page at trustedci.org. And with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap things up. It looks like people are saying thank you. Um, if they have any questions, they can always reach out to you and the framework team. So we'll leave things at that. Thank you again very much, Scott, for presenting. Any final thoughts? Uh, no, just thanks for having me. Great. And thanks to everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending and, and uh, watching this presentation. Um, with that, I'll, I'll end things. Everyone have a great day.